All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, I think it has been quite a number of weeks that we haven't done TCSS. So the reason was that I got sick for like one or one to two weeks. So uh, took a, a bit of break there. So now I'm back. Uh, let's do the usual TCSS now. So how we will structure this is that I will go through some presentations. Basically, these are the uh informations, uh like uh, quarterly earn earnings and then some macro reports. And then just uh, basically talk about uh, my my view on the markets. Uh. So I think it's it's not like like super insightful things. It's just that some of the things that I, I'm, I'm watching, uh, say for example, you know, like all the Fed stuff and then market, inflation, those kind of things. I think it's quite useful um, just to roughly know where are the markets now. Uh. Whether you want to use the information for your investment or not, I think that that's really up to uh, each individual. Some people, they they just say, okay, macro, I don't pay attention. So I just do my DCA. Some people say, we need to know where's the market. Then uh, maybe uh, do a bit of timing, meaning that if you think the market is going to go up, you better buy now instead of holding too much cash, right? So I think all these are, are still useful information. Uh. Okay, I'll, I'll start with uh, the big tech earnings first because you know these are my top um, holdings. So of course, uh, when they release the results, I pay a lot of attention to them. Make sure that they are, you know, they are on track in terms of their financials, their fundamentals, and the message that given by the management. Uh. So I think out of all the big techs that I'm following, right? Um, if I'm to rank, I will say that Microsoft and Amazon are really doing very well. Um, Apple, I would say that there's a bit of slowdown, uh, especially on Mac and uh iPad. But later, we will look at the results in, in more details. And then for TSMC, I would say their result is not so good, but the, their result is bad for quite a number of quarters already. So there's a bit of like semicon uh, slowdown. And now it seems that we are closer to the bottom than, you know, still going down. So so it has um the two a bit like, like stabilizing and Hopefully, over the next one or two quarters, we will see um, higher growth. Now. Okay, we, we will look at that also in, in more details. Uh, Google, I think it's okay, but but uh, relative to other big techs, I think not as good. Now. So let's start with uh, Microsoft. Uh. So I think when, when I look at the Microsoft results, right, I think basically what we want to look at is whether the company is growing or not. So here you can see that uh, in the latest quarter, three months, uh, um, and September 30, so there's a bit like 10, 10 plus percent growth, about 10% are in total revenue. Uh, 10%, if you ask me, I would say it isn't that impressive given that, you know, over the past one or two years, um, when their result is good, they can grow at 20, 20 plus percent. Uh, so so 10% is okay. It's, it's not like fantastic. But if you look at the overall financial statements, right, I think the, the impressive part is that how uh, how good they are at controlling their costs. Uh. So you can see that this is a uh, total cost of revenue, right? It's only uh, 15, this is 15 billions, um, only increased a little bit to 16 billions, but they are able to grow their revenue by about six plus billions. So, you, you know, when let's say their revenue go up at the same rate until as their um, costs, right? What it means is that there's no increase in earnings. But here we can see that most of the revenue increase, right? Actually, that there's no not much of a increase in terms of their cost. Uh. So you can see that their R and D also ab ab about flat. Their sales and marketing also about flat. Their general and administrative costs also about flat. So that's why you see that their net income, right, really increased by you know like about five billion, and their total revenue increased by six billions. That's why you see there's a huge increase in their um earning per share from $2.35 to $3, even though their sales, right, their revenue is only increased by 10%. So I think this is the thing, right? You, you, if you all still remember, there's uh, quite a fair bit of all this retren retrenchment uh, in tech sector, right? So I think it, it, it exerts some downward pressure to, to their wages. Uh. So that's why, you know, for, for companies, software companies especially, like, like Microsoft, right, they are as they are able to control their costs, um, their employees are not able to demand much higher um, wages, right? So th there's incremental benefits that flow to shareholders, la, which is good good to shareholder. So I think that's, that's one thing I want to point out. And then secondly, uh, if we look forward, right? Like I, I think I just post one one post on the uh, Funflix platform, right? I talked about Microsoft, right? To me, um, 
few things we want to know. Let's say if we have an outlook of three to five years, right? First thing, we want to know whether they are able to grow or not. And then secondly, we want to know whether they, this growth, right, is something that able to bring in profit or not. Uh, I would say for Microsoft, right, because of all these co-pilot, meaning that their products, right, although it's still the same product, like for example, they're still selling Windows, they're still selling all these uh, Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint, they're still selling uh, Microsoft Teams, all, all these different products, right, they are still the same main product line. But in terms of what they are able to uh, increase and charge the customer more is, is they, they pay it with this, what they call the co-pilot. Now. Like for example, all the GitHub co-pilot, they, they charge you extra uh, $20, $30 and then they say, okay, now this co-pilot is able to, to give you uh, additional features and so on. So it's not like the normal year on year, same Excel, they charge you a uh, higher amount. This is really like they are able to to you know, embed all this chat GPT, uh, generalized um, AI stuff into their product and charge more, right? Of course, the cost will be slightly higher, but you know, when when it comes to selling to all these corporate companies, right? Whenever you are able to give them extra features, right, and they try it, then they can't get rid of it anymore. Say for example, right, um, let's say companies do meeting. In the past, right, you need someone sit in the meeting room to just write down what have been discussed and then prepare the minutes, right? This one easily we are talking about, you know, like like hours of job just to record down the conversations and then record down in word document and need to, you know, like um improve the writing. Now this with all these uh co-pilot, right? They can just record and then um the features or or all this functionality, they can just just you know produce the minutes for you. At, at least although it's not it could maybe let's say if it is not hundred percent good, right? At least it's it produce something that's eighty or to ninety percent, which is quite close to the um end product that you want. And the best thing is that you don't need to you know ask for people help to help to write minutes. It's automatically generated there, you know. So that that's why I say it's there's no problem for them to um sell this kind of upsell uh, uh this kind of products charging you know like twenty thirty dollars per per head, right? But but and to justify it's just the in, uh, incremental productivities that come from the employees. Uh. If you measure how much they charge per license, right, versus the empo- employee salary, right, this is like a no-brainer. Uh. This, this is what I would say. Currently, they are still developing all these things. Let's say over the next three to five years, as all this technology mature, right, I, I would expect that easily there's incremental of like, you know, 100 million, 200 million uh, user that that um pay extra on board on all these features la. so this is my expectations la. so so that's why i say over the next uh, three to five years um in terms of their visibility like they're able to grow um the margins i think it will be there la. We, we just need to be patient and then just write through it la. okay that's microsoft um then comes to amazon so i think in the past let's say about one year la, if whenever i talk about amazon right i always say that okay these companies that are like two, let's call it three business lines. Lah. So two is on the e-commerce and then one is on their AWS. And then people always have this impression that AWS is the only one that, that's making money and the, all their e-commerce are not making money, which is true if you just look at the result um, after COVID. Let's say like if you look at the result in 2021 and 2022, that, that's true. All their e-commerce are not making money because they are spending a lot of money um, on all this you know, like capacity in terms of their logistic, uh, in terms of their warehouse, or all, all, all these like huge expenses, right? They put on all these capex, and suddenly they realize that there they isn't as as high demand as they expected. So, and then uh, from this year, uh, I think start, maybe started from last year, and definitely this year we we have observed that this trend to e commerce, right? Is like there's a bit of uh like normalizations. People go to e commerce during COVID, and then now they come back to the old habit of of not not, not spending as much in e commerce. Uh. That's why these two business line, right? The, the e commerce, right? They are losing money, as you can see here. Let's say look at twenty twenty two, right? Uh, the first nine months of twenty twenty two, you see operating income negative, operating income negative. Both their America and international all not making money. The, the only one that's uh making money is AWS. And then this year, I, I think we have seen some a bit of slowdown in AWS in terms of their growth, in terms of their margin, uh, isn't as good compared to last two years. So that there, there's always this worry that wow, the, the other two uh, e-commerce not making money, suddenly the one that's making money is is growing 
slower and then their margins has dropped. So I think th- there's one point of time that, that uh, this business people like losing faith on it. But it seems that uh, in the latest quarter, as you can see here, right, they are, la- later we'll go through the, the, the time series across different quarters. You can see that their e-commerce business is starting to make money as you can see here, 2022 to 2023, from losing 400 millions to making 4.3 billions. So this is definitely a good sign. Uh, their international market is always quite weak one. Even so, they are close to break even already. And then AWS, I think their growth, although it's not as high as uh, in the past, like you see here, net sales are only increased by about 10 plus percent. It's not like the 30, 40 percent kind of growth that they generated uh, in the past. But in terms of their growth, there's still some growth there, stabilizing. And then their expenses, their margin also uh, is doing okay. That's why you can see that their operating income still increased. So all in all, just look at this quarter compared to um, last year, right? There's huge improvement, meaning that um, margin-wise uh, has improved all the, over the e-commerce. And then oh, if you look at AWS, uh, growth already stabilizing and then uh, margin also uh, slightly improved. Uh. So I think this is uh, definitely some recovery that has been playing out well. Uh. So really, I think uh, all this, you know, cost cutting, retrenchment, all these things still helps. Uh. I think Amazon, they, they really retrench quite, quite a number of people and closing down quite a number of uh, business line that they don't want to continue to bet on. Uh. So so I can say that it's, it's really like come back to uh, more discipline kind of management rather than uh, like, you know, just keep on spending on CapEx like during the COVID period. Uh. So this is the one that I mentioned, the operating margin. As you can see here, they are not making money in 2022. Negative, negative, negative. And then uh, started from last quarter, their uh, operating margin has increased to 3.9%, now 4.9%. Then um, the inter- international e-commerce also, uh, last quarter is still negative 3%. Now it's already zero, negative 0.3%, so close to break even. I think next quarter, this one should be like a small positive now. Then uh, AWS, you can see last quarter, right? Um, uh, it's still like 24% now, come back to 30%. So I think AWS, um, the result was weak uh, last quarter and the quarter before that was also because they commented that um, there's a lot of like cost optimizations. Uh, customers spend less on their AWS and now um, it seems that whatever that they can optimize already close to, close to rip all the benefit already. So from now on, it seems that uh, the, the cost optimizations co- cost optimization will be smaller. And then um, we, then we, the, the sign that customers start to deploy new workloads. Lah. So I think that's also another good thing. So all in all, I will say these two, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, they are, they are very, very good. Then the next one, Apple. Okay, we know that Apple, you know, when they, they already launched um, iPhones, and when I go to Apple Store, uh, I think the two weeks after the launch, right, I can see that there's huge demand, uh, at least from Singapore. Uh, I, I don't know about other countries, but I believe that uh, they're doing well uh, in, in terms of um, demands of uh, iPhones. Um, and then also they, they just launched the MacBook M3 series. So I think for Q4 results, I expect that it will be, it, it will be uh, very good. Although the, the management, they, they commented that um, it's going to be about flat, but um, there's one last week, right? As we, there's discussion over over the uh, Telegram chat group, right? So some some quarter, they have more week compared to the other quarters. So it, it just happened that last uh, Q4 of last year, they have one additional week as compared to Q4 of this week. But even so, with one less week, they are able to break even. What it means is that um, the demand is still there, la, although it's not like fantastic growth, but it's still, it's still there. And for Apple, I, I would say Apple is, I think over the past few years, right, it's never a high growth company. So their growth, there's a little bit of growth, but the good part is that their margin is very stable. Um, gross margin stable, net margin stable. And then if you look at their uh, margins, it's also, um, there's some improvement, but this is nothing to do with the individual lines uh, margin increase. Last because as you know, like all these iPhones, you look at uh, MacBook prices, they, they hasn't been increased that a lot. But uh, what what is increasing is their services margin. Uh. So they, they spend a lot more in terms of their content, in terms of their, you know, like gaming services. Uh, services, right, when it comes to their margin, is always much higher than the hardware. So I think this is the one that helped them improve their margin. Um, 
the one I want to highlight is that uh, if you look at their business lines, right? I think uh, when I started making uh, YouTube, I remember like two or three years back, right? We have been um, looking at their, uh, I, I say I'm very bullish on this company is because the M1 uh, series. So I'm very bullish on, on their Mac series now. Because like, you know, when, when they go, go into ARM uh, chip, right, you can see that their battery uh, is like a lot longer. Um, they are not relying on Intel on their x86 chips. So they, they, that is the path that um, I'm very bullish about. But if we just look at their numbers over the past few quarters, right, you will notice that their Mac, iPad, the sales isn't that fantastic. In fact, if you just look at this quarter, right, um, it's actually like drop compared to the previous uh, year. So you can see, you see Mac here from 11.5 11 billion dropped to 7.6 and then iPad also dropped. I, I mean, as a consumer, uh, you should be happy on this because uh, if the sales isn't that fantastic, uh, they it's unlikely that they will keep on uh, increase their uh, price. Now. I think that's good from consumer perspective, but in terms of the... Um, income and revenue that they're able to generate from these uh, business lines is quite weak. Lah, okay? uh, but other areas, for example, the services uh, and iPhones, I think it's still quite stable. Lah. I think that's the, the good part about it. And in terms of geography, you can see that uh, the, the, the part that is quite weak is uh, China. You see China here, actually they, they didn't grow. Uh, from 15.4 billion actually dropped to 15.1 billion. There's, there's a bit of dip here. So this one, I, I don't think it's because of Huawei or anything like that. I think it's just because China, um, the uh, macro picture isn't that good. Nah. So after, you know, all this uh, real estate, I think th they will have some, you know, like um, effect into broader economies. Nah. Th this is what uh, we, we have been observing. Nah. Th that's my suspect. Nah. If you ask me to provide proof so far, I don't have that that much of uh, evidence. But I think overall slowdown in, in China isn't something that people debate about. Uh. It's, it's like quite quite obvious. So that's Apple. So the other one is um, TSMC. Uh, I would say TSMC uh, in terms of their business, actually, if you understand their customer business, right, then, then you will know where TSMC is. Uh. So um, for now, I think they are supporting uh, like Apple in terms of their iPhone 15 Pro models. The... Um, all the three nanometer chips, right? And then at the same time, I think they, they also uh, uh, manufacture chips for, you know, like MD, NVIDIA. So you just look at the all, all the customers' growth, you can see how, how good are they. But I would say for, for TSMC, right, is that um, it has been bad for many quarters and now it's like slightly better. So I think it's progressing well. Um, no complaint on that. And the part that I, I am very bullish on is, you know, and whenever they have a new, like, what they call the process notes. Lah. So you can see here, this one quarter, the, the, the green one is the yeah, three nanometer chip. This is the one that are uh, powering the iPhone 15 Pro. So this green bar here, right, it will increase substantially over the next uh, one to two years. Lah. So because the, the next one, let's say iPhone 16 Plus, right, they might do a three plus, something like that. So, but it's still under the three nanometer family. Lah. So this one, the green one will, will keep on increase uh, in, in the future. And all this big data, chat GPT, AI stuff, or all this chip also, they will leverage on, on three nanometer chips. Uh. But this is uh, still early. The three nanometer will, will increase uh, substantially over the next two years. And then the part that I think is quite interesting, which I don't hear many people talk about, it, is, their, um, is their capex. So if you just go back, right, within this, uh, let's call it what, uh, one year before, right? They're actually spending a lot of money in terms of their capex. So they need to, you know, like uh, set up fabs, they need to buy all this expens expensive uh, machinery and and their results, right? Because of that, all this slowdown in smartphone market, in PC market. So you couple these two together, right? Meaning that they their profit, their revenue profits slow down and then they still need to spend on their capex. What it means is that their free cash will actually drop a fair bit. This chart here, right, that I'm showing, this is actually the uh, rolling 12 months. So so when rolling 12 months can drop so much, right, over the last two quarters, right, it's, what it means is that actually their cash flow, free cash flow is, is, is quite bad, you know. So this is the situation that they are facing. But comment from the management is that they actually they will slow down the intensity uh, of the capex. What it means is that whatever money that they need to spend on, right, like building fabs, like all this uh, machinery, they already spend over the coming one year or two year, 
Uh, yes, they are still uh, spending on all these capex, but uh, the growth of the capex uh, will stagnant. Uh, as the growth of capex stagnant, and as they roll out all these three nanometers, all this demand come back as smartphone uh, cycle bottom and slowly increase back. Uh, I will expect that this this uh free cash flow right will go back up again. So you you can see that for semicolon right, there's a clear cyclical pattern one. You see up down up down up down. So all this is because there's a uh, you know different period of time. Sometimes there, there's there's just like a couple of years that they need to increase the capex in intensity. Uh, just to make sure that they secure um, the the machinery to to produce for their customer over the upcoming years, right? So what happened is that they already like you know uh, spend huge amount of money. So over the coming years, you will see the the capex improve. Now I think this is definitely good for for the shareholders now. So I think I'll just cover these few companies. Uh, we will move on to look at um the other uh, uh macro topics but before that just uh do a quick update on my on my portfolio la. so i think if you look at this portfolio value right starting from about i would say early this year maybe q first quarter this year until now it has been relatively flat now so the reason is that i haven't been deploying that much uh into my portfolio i've been saving up a bit of cash uh in you know like tv and money market funds so here i, I still put some money but uh it's a lot lesser compared to you know like um last year la. so uh that's why it's quite flat here but in just a preview on you know like um last year closer to the end of the year i also shared what was my returns right for those who don't recall you can go, go back to my uh video close to end of last year and you notice that my my return last year was very very bad it seems that this year has been doing relatively well as you can see here almost 40 percent return uh, i'm not saying that this 40 percent that i'm that smart you know this is just the market returns uh, because given that um, my portfolio concentration is towards tech stock and as you know from early this year until now uh the magnificent seven right all these you know nvidia uh, Microsoft, Amazon, they're doing quite well. So that's why the returns has been okay. This is over one year period also okay. But the year before that, it was very, very bad. So so just uh, a, a quick update on in terms of my portfolio. But moving forwards, right, just to give you some, some idea on how I'm managing my portfolio is that uh, I probably will put more into ETF. This blue line will continue to go up. Um, the reason is because, you know, um, as I look at my portfolio, right, my portfolio isn't something that's is very concentrated. It's not like I I have, you know, like 40, 50% into one stock, right? If you look at uh, allocation like this, uh, it isn't that different compared to QQQ. Uh, maybe there's some differences. For example, I have TSMC and then QQQ, definitely they don't have TSMC. And then I have some Tencent, they don't have... I mean, there's some selection, uh, company selection that is different. But in terms of the allocation, it isn't that different. It looks like an ETF. The question is that do, do I still want to hold so much uh, into individual stocks given that if you compare right ETF wise uh, it's still a lot lesser than my individual stocks right but um, individual stocks there's always this problem with your know, uh, withholding tax la. although the companies that I, I hold right they pay very low amount of dividends so not big of a concern but if this portfolio continue to go up right and they pay dividends every time I receive dividends I need to pay the 30% withholding tax right it's still quite taxing as the portfolio grow la. so that's one consideration to me the other one is that let's say right um, I, I don't know I invest this for, for a very long period of time right let's say if there's some situation where I need to move on and then accidental death kind of situations, there's this uh, huge tax that uh, US government is going to levy on, on my portfolio. So I think that one is also some, some of my concern that actually we can uh, avoid that by investing in ETF, specifically those U6 ETF. La. So that's why I, I'm thinking that, okay, um, given that this is really invest for the long term and my portfolio is quite close to 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 ETF, right? I I'm, I don't mind to put more money into into ETF, like the U6 ETF. Right? So maybe I'll buy some IUIT, uh, which is still heavy on tech. It, it, maybe it's not that different compared to my portfolio, but uh, I'll, I'll move more into ETF right? basically just, just to have a more balanced uh, allocation between individual. Last time I invest in individual company is because I think I really want to get exposure, uh, like meaningful exposure into the companies that I like, like the one that I do research on. For example, like all these Apple, Microsoft, Nvidia, Tesla. That's why I, I focus on individual stocks. I think for from now on, maybe uh, just put a, a bit more extra uh, in ETF. Uh. So that's that's my plan. 
you see there's these questions that ask about like is the recession over uh is it uh start start to buy i think there are many people who really like talk about recession quite a bit because if you read financial news financial news also keep talking about recession whether the recession is, is already here or recession is coming or something like that it's always like like talking about recession right because during a recession it's true that stock market will will suffer uh but actually if you look at the data right so this is the us i'm talking about us the largest economy the, the other economies they they mostly follow us one now okay so us if you look at their gdp quarterly change, right? It's still positive and they are doing quite well. I think it's 4.9% uh, in the latest quarter. You need uh, two uh, consecutive quarter of negative growth to call it technical recession. And it's not even like the former, like the uh, recession, like the, the definition one. Like for example, during 2022, you see that there's two uh, negative quarterly growth, right? This one, they don't call it as a, as a recession. The 2020, this one, yes, this is a recession, but 2022, this is not a recession. Okay, maybe um, they 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 have their own, you know, like qualitative judgment to say, okay, this is not, there's some technical issue here just because of the metrics. Uh, they, they don't they don't label it as a, as a recession. Now. As of now, definitely now it's not a recession and definitely 2023 is not a recession because you don't have enough quarter to generate two negative quarter here, right? So the answer is is no. We are we are doing well, you know. Uh, you, in terms of U.S. economy, is doing okay. If the economy is not doing well, right? Say for example, if we see a negative uh, uh GDP growth, right? Let's say two quarter, right? Um, I don't think they will keep the Fed fund rate at like five point five five about five point five percent, right? They will definitely uh drop it now. So the the reason they are able to keep it so high. Uh, it's because the economy is doing okay and and they are doing more okay than many people expected. So this this is the first uh, message. Uh. But that doesn't mean that we, we, we won't see if recession, let's say over 2024 or 2025, because as you know, like nobody can actually predict that far into the future, right? Maybe we can predict up to, you know, the first half of next year, probably won't, won't have recession. But from second half of next year until 2025, who knows, right? So, but actually, but at least we should know like today, right? Today, no recession. So don't ask about like whether the recession is, is over or not because we are not even in one. Okay, so that's that's the message I want to share. Then um, the other one, if you just look at corporate earning per share, right? Um, like what do you see here in this chart? It's going up, right? Uh, aside from period during 2008 and during, you see here, this this dip here, this is during COVID. Of course, during those uh, period, uh, there's huge drop in terms of the earning per share. But as of now, you see there's a little, little bit of slowdown, but overall it's still trending up. So I would say for corporate earnings wise, um, they're doing okay. Not, not, too, not too bad. That's also why stock market hasn't been like dropping a lot. Nah. That's what I want to say. Then this is uh, operating earning per share, and this is showing the yearly percentage change. Okay, during 2021 and maybe a bit of 2022 here, this is really because you compare to the previous years, right? Which there's a lot of issues during, uh, 2020 is during COVID, like all the shutdown. And then 2021 is all the supply chain problem and so on. So also there's there's a bit of um, um, uh, impact there. So 2022, Two and 2023, this is where you know we, we already get past those period and and when when you compare year over year in terms of their earning per share change slightly normalizing and there's some sign that there's some negative growth in terms of their earnings here. Okay, why this is the case? I also not too sure. And maybe it's because you know like interest rate increase, um, so interest costs also increase, right? That could be one. And then in terms of the inflation, still still inflation quite high. I think that could be one. So there, there are all sorts of reasons, uh, but I, can't, I cannot pinpoint why the, the growth has uh, dropped. Uh. Growth has dropped doesn't mean that companies are not making money. Uh. It's maybe they, they make uh, slightly less money compared to the year before. So this is uh, something to, to uh, pay attention to. And then this is the revenue surprise. What it means is that, you know, the analysts, they pro project all this revenue, right? Then whether uh, the companies beat the uh, revenue estimation or not, yeah, as this, if this is uh, above zero, that means there's a positive surprise. Huh? Um, I think over the past two to three years, uh, we, we keep on having positive surprise, but the positive surprise and uh, the magnitude has decreased a bit here. Huh? Then if you look at earnings, uh, it's still quite decent uh, in terms of uh, surprise. What it means is that although the earnings 
uh, if you look at this one, right, earnings has dropped compared to last year. But if you compare it against the expectation, right, they're still doing well, meaning that whatever drop, right, is something that um, analysts already expected. Now. And they're doing better than that. So that's one thing to look at. And then, of course, this is my favorite to just have a gauge on whether the market is very expensive or very, very cheap. You just look at it, right? It's, it's like at the middle middle it's, it's not like super expensive you know like super expensive you need to look at you know close to maybe like 20 22 times and then if it gets super cheap maybe it needs to be you know below 15, 14 la. right now we are at about 18 times i would say it's, it's quite fair and it is here also because um like all all the good things uh the the overall macro picture is still decent if the if if let's say like the sign of recession it become more and more obvious right this line here it will start to drop okay because this is they are comparing against the forward earnings right so so um it, it will fluctuate uh, based on the based on the sentiment at, at the time so this is something to look at then uh, of course the latest one which just came up last friday right so the job growth is of uh, 150k um, the consensus, the forecast, they are around 180 to 190K. So it's lower than expected, right? So it, it, it shows the sign of some you know, cooling in terms of the uh, job market. Now. So this is definitely good uh, for in, in terms of the inflation. But if this number become too low, right? Become like um, 100K, zero, or even losing job, right? So that, that's really like sign of recession already. But we are not there yet, like you can, as you can see here. Every month, right? Um, US side, at least they are adding job. It's just that some month they are adding like close to three hundred k. Um, some month they are adding like you know hundred k. So so it, it bounce around, like. So, but anyway, still still okay. This is a good sign. Then the other thing I want to point to is the thirty year Treasury rate, now. So um, I I know over the past one month it's exceeded like five percent, right? So all this right, bond market, right? The pricing, it will always have some impact to the stock market one. Because as the bond market uh, is paying you 5%, do you still want to bet on the stock market that's able to give you 5%? Or why not just put some money into like bond market, right? So, and bond market, the reason it shoot up so much, right? There, there are a few reasons. Uh, um, one is that there's uh, increased issuance of the treasuries. Uh, you know, the US, they are running a lot of all this um, deficit, right? So they need to issue money to fund their fiscal spending. And then secondly, I think Fed is still like slowly, slowly let the boat, uh, their tre treasury holdings run off. I think this will also increase uh, the supply and, and also um, they, they, as they are not buying back to replace their holdings, right? Meaning that now we have less uh, buyer in, in um, US treasury market now. So that's also something uh, to pay attention to. So basically, it's supply demand uh, that, that caused all this change. Uh, okay. Then, of course, the one that we want to pay attention to is the inflation number, uh, which is in about one week plus. Um, if inflation slow down more, I think market will rally, uh, as simple as that. Then the last one is the Fed fund rate. Uh, I, I think this number, right? Um, you see we are here at 5.25% to 5.5%. Uh, market is market is expecting that the Fed fund rate will continue to uh, to be flat until first quarter of next year. And then slowly there will be a uh, rate cut. Uh, so until 4.25% 4, 4 uh, by about end of next year. Uh, but what has changed, right, compared to, let's say, let's call it like one month ago, is actually the probability of whether there will be a rate increase here. I think at the peaks is about maybe between 30 to 40%. Uh, that market really believe that there's a uh, significant probability that there might be one more hype uh, next one to two months. But it seems that uh, after the job, uh, the job market re result came out, right, um, this probability has decreased uh, quite substantially. Now. And I, I think uh, our friend YCX also mentioned, right, that he, he don't expect there's uh, any any uh, rate increase. Now. So although here this market is implying that there's a 5%, uh, but, but I think, including myself, I also think that they, they, are, they are not going to do a rate hike um, anymore. It, it means that this number is, is already, already um, you know, like peak. But whether this number, they will start to cut in May next year, I think this is still a huge question mark there. It, it's possible that they just maintain for longer, right? So that's also possible. Uh, the first one, Punti, last time you give us uh, 12ft.io website is down. It's very kind of you to share. Do you have other similar website to share with us? So actually, I don't recall what is this. Uh, maybe I've shared something in the past. I, I don't recall. But I think um, 
I asked in the chat group, someone mentioned that this is some uh, website to help bypass the paywall, right? Okay, I, I don't know about this. Uh, I, I think the one that, let's say if you're talking about like some, you know, article, FT F, F, article or Wall Street Journal that you want to read and then and then they ask you to subscribe, right? What you can do is just use this uh, website called the archive.ph. So that, yeah, that, that's the one that that's quite um helpful. Basically, you just put the link into the archive and then sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, but you can give it a try. Lah. So at least you can get, read that article, right? So that, that's um, some trick. Um, yeah, I only have one. Lah. So if that one also doesn't work, uh, need to find another way. Lah. Okay, that's first question. Second, Bunti, uh, you can run through the broker platform that you are using other than IBKR. Give us some demo and their functions. Give your referral link to them. Thanks. Uh, this one, I think if I'm to do something like this, I think maybe we do it on, on a separate session. But I think for now, I my focus is really just IBKR. Uh, um, okay, so so IBKR I've been using for quite some time and, and I, I haven't been that active also. Uh, it's just that when I need to buy, I just log on to, to buy, right? And I, I do agree that IBKR sometimes is quite quite difficult to use. Um but I think it's still the one that is uh, overall quite good uh, in terms of the market access. You can buy all sorts of different geography, Hong Kong stock you can buy, Singapore stocks. I think, I think for those who register using the Singapore IBKR, also you can buy US, you can, Europe, U6, all those you can buy, right? I think that's the best part. And in terms of cost, it's still the best one. Uh. Others, maybe, you know, like um, those Mumu also, I think in terms of the UI, DAS is much better, but in terms of the cost of uh, uh like trading costs, I, I won't recommend others. Lah. So that, that's my my um preference. Okay, uh in terms of the demo, uh, I would say um, my channel may may not be a good idea. Lah. You I think you, this one you just look just search uh Kevin Learn Investing. Um uh, um they uh, other YouTubers, right? I think they have much a uh, better demo in, uh, in terms of how to use the platform. Lah. In terms of referral link, I, I would say don't bother. Lah. I think throughout these two years, sometimes I post my referral link. I don't notice anyone sign up using mine. So I, I don't bother about this also. Okay, um, let's move on to the next one. Munti, can you share your thoughts after reading Elon Musk's uh, 2023 book? For me, too much red flag. It changed my opinion of Elon Musk and I sold off my entire Tesla positions. Okay, then followed by the second one. Too much red flag. The number one is his personality and I find his his huge emotional swing which won't generate wisdom intelligence is not wisdom okay let me share my view actually uh, for those who haven't read this book right it's, I really highly recommend uh, it's, it's a very very easy to read book and there's a lot of details there and I think the the um, the best part of this book is that you know for Elon Musk right he's always a high profile person right so if you watch YouTube you read uh, news you will know the stories that have been told in the book uh, it's just that sometimes you know when we read all this information piece by piece we, we don't know um, how they link together but because this is a book, right? Uh, the author really able to, you know, chain all these different uh episodes, all, all these different incidents, and then chain together, and then they, uh they, they have some internal stories as well that that help us understand why uh something happened, right? So I think that's the best part, now. Like you know the internal story, whether whether how true it is, I also can't say, but at least there's a coherent kind of story to tell, like like who is who is Elon Musk and why he's doing something um, like his rationale, I think you will have a much better understanding after reading the book. Uh. So that, that's the uh, first thing. And then in terms of my thoughts on Elon, right, I would say I don't have any surprise for me because the reason is that I've read quite a fair bit about him. Okay, For example, uh, when he appeared in uh, Joe Rogan podcast, like, you know, those podcasts is like hours, hours and podcasts, right? So I, I really went through those uh, materials. So as you, you get into the direct per persons, right? Like Elon Musk talking, right? You can understand what he's thinking about. And in fact, if you watch enough, right? You will notice that his message, right? It's kind of become repetitive already. So so that's why I feel that I, I can understand his thinking in terms of why he's doing certain things. Um, And also because uh, before I read this book, I also read the book before that, right? Um, 
I can't remember the names already. There's there's another uh biography that's quite famous later. I'll put in the screenshot here. Uh, I, I think it's quite quite useful to know like his personality, all these things. So for me, I, I don't have any surprise. I think he's just Kim. Uh but I think that's the things, right? Nobody is, is perfect, right? So he also has his own uh the author called him demons, right? Inside in, inside himself. Like for example, when when he just took over Twitter, um he strongly believed that okay, these entire organizations they don't need the kind of uh headcount that they they had right before he took over right. So before he, he got into the companies, he, he already know that he he need like probably like one quarter of the headcounts right. So went in straight away slash jobs or uh, slash the the headcounts and then people just have to go right. So he he's very ruthless when it comes to this kind of um actions. Uh, and also when he managed Tesla, like the kind of things that he do is very, very drastic. Um, but I think that's because he, in terms of personality, maybe you can say that he don't have much empathy. La. This one I, I do agree. And and in fact, it, 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 that's the personality that, that has been portrayed by, uh, like brought up by the author, right? So I think that's his personality, right? But it's, it's good for the business because you really need this kind of people to drive the business, to drive the visions. Um, he's not going to be a perfect, you know, like perfect husband, perfect uh, boss. So that, that, that'd be it, right? Because everyone, every leader, every person is just different. But whether he's an effective leader or not, this one are, are definitely things that he is. Nah. So um, that's why for me, I I'm, have been holding Tesla shares for, for quite some time. Uh, although I, have, I haven't been adding, but still I, I don't feel like I need to, you know, sell the uh, positions because I, I don't think... He, uh, his personality is good or bad, uh, something like that. Uh. So, so I think I'm I'm judging his um, you know his his executive like, like whether he's able to lead the company or not, uh, rather than whether he's a good boss or not, he is a good person or not. Uh. So that is my feel on this. Uh. but again, uh, his personality is a very complex one. Uh, so it's not that easy to just you know like you know brush through it. Uh. for those who who's really interested, right, I would say just read the book. And then if you, after you read the book, you think that, oh, yo, this kind of companies, I, I will never put my money onto, onto this company. I think that's fair, you know, because it, it, it's not for everyone. So that's, that's, the, that's, that's why there's a lot of all this disagreement between whether Tesla is a good investment or not. For, for those who strongly believe, they say it's yes. For those who, who say no, uh, they definitely, it's like a strong no. Uh. So, so I think that's, that's why this makes the company and that's also makes what, um, Elon's personality interesting, right? It's it's very, very extreme. So yeah, okay. This one I have went through a recession over start to buy. The question is, there's no recession yet. Uh, but your, if your question is, is it will be will there be a recession next year? Oh, that that's always something that's hard to tell. Uh. Okay, <laughs> start to buy. Um, uh, okay, the start to buy part. Uh, I would say just constantly buy. Uh. I think that's the that's the, uh, philosophy that I think we all should follow. Uh. Even for myself, um, like maybe put less into stock market, but still I'm buying treasury, right? So, so treasury also still is, is a buy. <laughs> Just buy, buy, buy. Okay. Uh, do you have 1 million in portfolio now? I think the question, uh, okay, I'll say short answer is no. Lah, okay. As I shared just now, my stock portfolio, 500K uh, plus minus. And then if you want to add in my treasury bill, also it's not even, you know, less than 100K there. Uh, if you want to add CPF, I think that's another uh, story, right? I'll, I'll say short answer is no, lah. I'm, I'm not that rich, lah, okay? I, I'm just a salary man, okay? Uh, no po 1 million portfolio. But if you ask me whether I expect to hit 1 million portfolio, okay, as long as I remain healthy, remain like don't lose my job, uh, to hit one million, I, I think this is uh, a matter of when, not not if lah. Okay, we'll we'll be there. We'll be there. So I'm not worried. Uh, you you also shouldn't be worried about about my progress. Okay, <laughs> all right. Next one. Uh, do you think inflation will go up when the report is released later this month? Elon is erratic. Okay, you are talking about the upcoming inflation numbers, right? So I I think this one, right? If you look at the forecast, right? Uh, they, they are saying that is about like 3.8%. So it's like, you know, what uh, central bank want to achieve is the 2%, the magic number, 2%, right? And then they have successfully brought the inflation down from, I think about 9% now to 
uh, just below 4%, right? So there's still a, some distance between this, like, let's call it 3.7 to 2%, right? It's very sticky. They want to bring it down. That's why the uh, Fed fund rate has stayed at like 5% plus, right? So they want to bring it down, but it seems that it's very sticky, very hard. But if you ask me whether this 3.7% will go up to 4, 5, 6, 7, I also don't think so, lah, okay? Given that now all this cooling uh, measure, the, the interest rate is high, um, all this, there's a, there's a cooling measures that's ongoing there. I don't think it will skyrocket up uh, unless really suddenly there's some some you know like escalated war in in Middle East and then oil price shoot up. That 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 one aside, right? If you don't have incident like that, I do think that um, I don't expect it will like skyrocket back up now. Okay, but whether they are able to bring it down to two percent without causing a recession, I think that's the most difficult thing to do la, Because it, of course, if there's a recession, people losing job, of course, of course, inflation will be down to two percent quickly. Then um, then Fed is able to cut rate, but doesn't mean uh, stock market is a good investment because you know, as you see, all the corporate revenue go down, all the earnings go down, people losing their job, people are scared. Don't expect that uh, just because Fed cut like 50 basis point, then stock market is going to rally. Don't expect that to happen. Yeah? So, uh, it will be quite tough period if the recession hit us hard. Nah? So that's the thing. But come back to the, your questions, right? whether you ask me whether it will go up or not, I think even if it go up, I, I, do ex- I don't expect huge changes. Nah? It could be like 3.8, 3.9, but maybe it come back down to 3.6, 3.7. It will be around this, uh, this level. Nah? From month to month, usually um, won't, won't, won't have such a big changes one now okay at least now it's like stagnant uh stagnating around uh flatting uh, at, at current level okay uh elon's i think elon uh he complained a lot uh, he complained about manufacturing he complained about um like interest rate is too high i think interest rate is too high is really bad for for car business uh, because you know people buy cars they don't buy with cash right they buy with uh taking up loan right if the loan is very costly to service, of course, there will be less people buying car. So as simple, simple as that, right? So whether the Fed will cut the interest rate or not, I think it still depends on the overall inflation of the overall economies, right? So still, we don't know. Um, like I, I don't play too, too much all these predictions. Uh. You you predict already, uh, it's like more, more often uh, I will get wrong rather than right. So I don't do the predictions. Just continue to invest. Do the systematic investing rather than, you know, getting in and out. Okay. This one. Why YCX always argue with people? This one, we wait YCX join us next time you ask him, okay? <laughs> I don't want to comment on him when he's not around. Uh, okay, there's a comment on that question, I think. I don't agree why CX argue with people. He speaks freely because he's not earning money as a guru. Some guru may seem pro, but they are video link, stock pick. You be careful. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. I think why CX, right? It's just that he really speaks his, his mind. So that's why we all also enjoy interacting with him. It's just that don't be, don't, don't take him too personally. Like. It's just that he, he, he's like very direct person. Like. So, so, um, that's the, that's the, you know, like you say, right? Like, like different personality. So, everyone have, have their own right uh this part also i i do agree like um some guru may seem pro um like whether they are video they are pick uh i think be careful i think this is true for everyone right? this guru even if it is warren buffett whether it's like howard marks also the same everyone have their opinions right but if you just follow blindly and then you lose money you you, you blame others i think that's the not the right way right? you should do your own research then you need to be accountable to your own decisions. Uh. That's how everyone become better in investing. If every every time you lose money, you blame others, then it's hard to improve. Uh. Okay, uh, next one. Regardless, Tesla operating metrics are weakening, becoming like the ICE companies. Okay, this one, operating metrics, right? I think that's to be more uh, precise here. I think you are talking about the margin, I believe. And also the revenue growth has been slowing down. I think this one, right, definitely is it reflect first thing is the macro environment is really bad. Like like what Elon said, right? The interest rate is high, people are buying less car. At the same time, I think Tesla also churning many more cars compared to like just two years ago. So it, it's come, it come back to like a bit like a supply demand things, right? As you as the supply of car increase, then the demand um, it, like it, even it, it grow, but it doesn't grow as fast as the supply, right? You have supply demand issues. So what happened is that either Tesla have to restrict their production, 
or they have to cut their prices and just pump more cars, right? So the strategy they have been using is that they choose to reduce the car price. Uh, as you can see, they are, they are, um, in terms of the number of cars sold, right? Still growing quite well. But because the car prices, the average prices has dropped, right? So if you look at the overall revenue numbers, it is quite low now. And mainly it's because of the car, uh, the price cut rather than they're selling less car compared to work to, to uh, the year before, right? So I think that's one thing to, to note like, is the macro environment causing them cutting prices. And cutting prices, it hits their overall revenue because average car price drop, right? Times the uh, higher increase of the car sold. Also, you get slightly, number num uh, slightly lower numbers. And then, of course, the margin also dropped because your average car price dropped, right? Your gross margin already lower. So all this number, if you go to the um, the deck, right? The, the slides, right? That they show. You can see that their, their year, on year over year growth already slowed down. Their gross margin also slowed down. Their net margin also slowed down. But at least for now, right? Their free cash flow margin, uh, their free cash flow is still positive. Meaning that they are, they are not burning out their cash and they need to borrow money, that kind of thing. It's not there yet. We don't know whether they will continue to cut prices or not. So yes, I do agree with you. Operating metrics is really weakening. We don't know when they will bottom. I also have no idea. Um, but hopefully all these things, right? It's just like a temporary situation uh, whereby, you know, like uh, to a certain extent, let's say talking about next year, there will be some rate cut and then uh, the supply demand will stabilize and then there will be more people buying car. Hopefully, uh, Cybertruck will bring in a lot more demand and then hopefully they're scaling up their production well and then get into cash flow positive on the Cybertruck. So if you just look ahead like two to three years, I think you can still be hopeful on, on the progress of the companies. And then of course, all this FSD, people debate it a lot, right? Whether they were able to achieve FSD, uh, all these things. I think there's a endless debate but my expectation is that, right, compared to now versus the year after, versus 2025, at least I don't think their FSD is going to, you know, like become worse. Lah. So also at least they are improving. It's just that whether they improve fast or improve slow. So it continue, there will be, there, there will be improvement. So hopefully over the next three to five years, uh, it's something that they are able to, to make it works and make it some, a reason for people to buy Tesla car instead of some other brands, right? So I think, uh, you need to look beyond beyond one to two years. Lah. If you're just looking at the current one, two quarters, right? And you want to bet that there, there will be a reversal, right? I I, I do I don't think um you will like it's quite that there's quite a high chance that the the weakening operating metrics will continue. Lah. That's that's my expectations. Lah. Next one. How do you assess live prices speeds from IBKR platform? Do you pay for it or how you how you buy US stocks without live uh, feeds. Okay, about the live feeds, right? Actually, I don't have on my IBKR website. I don't have it. Okay. Um, I think if you want to have it, you can just subscribe to their market prices. I, I don't think it's that expensive. Uh, but my trick is that I just use Mumu. I just use uh, Trading View to check the live prices. Uh. So like the Trading View, right? The, the chart uh, showing the, the price, right? Uh, that one for US stocks, they're showing live prices. Uh, I think for other markets, for example, like you know, like all the U6 ETF or Hong Kong market, some of them they are, they are showing um, you know, like with 15 minutes lag. Uh. So it just depends on the market. Uh, there will be uh, websites that's showing live prices. Uh. So I think you can you can check those up. But for me, uh, I think the most convenient one is really just using Mumu. I, I look at the Mumu, they show me live prices. I I if I need to buy, I can um place my order by just just key in the, the the limit prices that that I want to put in. Uh. So so it's just like a bit uh not so convenient. Like like you need to go different platforms, do different things, right? Check prices here and then move to the other platforms to buy. Uh I, I agree that it, this is not that convenient. If you want the convenience, you can just buy the market prices. Uh. It's it's quite cheap one, uh, no, you don't don't worry about the cost. Uh. But for me, it's not like every day I'm buying, right? I sometimes I don't I don't have uh, like like even my ETF, I, I don't buy it like every month. So to me, like all this so-called inconvenience, we are talking about once in a one month kind of things or a few months kind of things, not, not an issue for me. La. I don't know about you. I, I think let's say for someone who is actively trading, getting in and out, one every day you also have in and out, right? And, and 
I, I do think that in, if that's the case, maybe you just subscribe to the market prices. It's, it's much more convenient for you. Um, I, I would say it really depends on each individual on, on how, how you use it. Okay, that's on this. When people do YouTube or paste their links so as to earn money, you be careful. When people give advice, show positions and accountability with no benefit, you grateful. Um. Okay, I don't know. Okay, I I have no opinion on this uh. Uh, Let Let's take it this way, like even for people. Let's say, for example, like my um my friend Kelvin, he always you know like like put on some useful and en entertaining uh you know like like uh for entertainment or for education. Also, I think his video is great uh, I would say uh, I I really enjoy his content. Um, but if you ask me, like we, inside that content, he put in some advertisement. He tried to, you know, kind of like be an influencer and get you to sign up to it to certain platform and so on. You ask me whether that is like um like you do you need to be careful? I don't think it's that serious, you know, because I, I do think that it's like just an advertisement, right? He just pass on the message from the from from the advertiser, right? So in return, he also get to earn because you can't expect someone to keep on churning good product, doing it full time and then without earning any money. So how 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 is you know people, influencer, content creator going to to feed the family, right? So there's no way that you know content creator can can you know earn a living by not doing some sort of advertisement. Okay. So give and take, right? So if you want these people to keep on giving good content and then uh continue to do this on a full time basis, right? You 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 need to understand that he need to do some sort of this kind of advertisement, okay? Then people like don't do this kind of advertisement. For example, I don't do much, okay? Maybe some you know backholder pot. We 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 promote a bit and then earn some money. I think that's true. I'm I'm part of the of the crew there. But talking about my own channel, right? I can talk for hours. I don't expect to earn one cent from anyone, right? To me, it's fine because I'm still working full time. I can't do this kind of thing full time because if I do this content create 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 content creation full time, then uh, really no way to feed my my family, right? So I I think that's the way to show it. Like it's not like every anyone that get you to sign up certain thing, whether it's courses, whether it is like advertisement. Don't 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 just immediately say, wow, did you see this person want to earn money from me? Uh be, be, better be careful. Uh, I don't think that's the case. La. You just need to see how the economics works. La, okay. Uh yeah. If not, maybe if you if you find it too difficult to understand, right? Maybe you can try to do the content creation yourself. Or then you understand all the dy dynamics in in there. La. So so that's my my take on this. La. Okay, how do you catch up with the market and reshape after leaving your portfolio or equities idle for two years? Okay, first thing, uh, I'm not idle for two years. <laughs> I, I don't know why suddenly there's these two years things coming up here. Uh, even if I have deployed a lot less money into the market, I'm still watching. Um, like yeah, Sometimes it's just watching the chatter in the chat group. Sometimes it's like reading some financial news. Sometimes it's like just scrolling some Twitter, X, you know, just just do this kind of reading. Um, I'm still able to follow the markets. Uh, sometimes you you have any market-related questions you want to ask me, at least for those that I know, for those that have watched or, or pay attention to, I can comment a bit. Of course, the market is huge, right? Everyone pay attention to different things. No one in the world is able to know everything. Uh, but of course, if there's a question, we do a bit of research, we can we can make sense of what, what's going on. At least you you can you can leverage on other people's research, right? So I think this is uh, something that everyone can do. But let's say if you really get out from the market for too long, um, I think probably just by reading up, you, it might take some time just to know what, what, what's going on. So, so I'll say this one, I don't think, I don't expect people to spend like, like you know, long hours every day. La. It's just like, you know, like, like when you are traveling, when you're taking MRT, you just scroll your Twitter a bit. Sometimes you, you're not that far away on, you, you will have a sense on, on uh the you know what what's going on around the world, so these are like some some you know pieces of inf information here and there But if you really want to have a deep understanding on certain topic, right? Um, I think that one you still need to pick up a book la. So so like you say, okay, people has been debating about Elon, like you have no idea other than listening to people debate. 
But if you really want to have in-depth understanding, pick up the book, read the book right in in like few. Uh, it's it's a quick read one uh, It's very easy to read. Then then you have a much better understanding. In in any topics also like that. Just just pick up a book right then, then you will have a very solid foundation. Uh. To be a successful stock picker, does one need to have a finance business degree and working in a related role? This one, the answer is definitely no. <laughs> no need. You just need to pay attention, just need to do your reading. Uh, and when we talk about stock picker, right, you just need to read enough of the companies that you pick. And what do you mean by read enough is that you need you need to go to their, you know, like for example, their 10Q, their annual report. You need to read other people's research on the company. So as you read all these things enough, right? And, and not just the company, you need to understand who are the competitors, you need to understand who are the suppliers, who are the who are the uh, customer. As you read enough on all this, right, then you have good understanding on the business then at least you know why you invest into the companies. Whether you will be successful in terms of like, you know, uh, like do better than the overall markets. Okay, I will say that one is a lot harder to achieve. Even I myself, right, when, when it comes to stock pick, uh, okay, maybe this year I beat the market. Uh, like last year, I didn't, you know. So overall, from inception basis, I'm I'm quite close to the market, uh, slightly below the market actually. But, but to me, uh, the goal isn't like just to, you know, outperform S&P, that kind of goal, you know. The goal is that, let's say, if when I invest in individual companies, I have to understand the company enough to say, okay, I enjoy owning the shares of the company. I enjoy being part of the shareholders, right? So that one, you read enough, you can you can understand the business, you can understand the company. But whether you beat the market or not, I think that is a totally different bar. Even I myself, I, I don't, okay? That's why I haven't teach you guys how to beat the market i only teach you guys like how i share like how i'm looking at all these companies and why i'm stay investor and why sometimes if i divest also i explain why so so these kind of things i can share like that, that's mainly my own view okay not 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 saying that by doing these kind of things you are able to beat the market because it's really really difficult okay but come back to this right you don't need all this and you don't need to work in the role. The reason is because if you even if you work in the finance or business kind of role, right, you you are too concentrating into the role itself. And sometimes you can ask those who are working as an employee, right? You can ask the person, right? Like, do you know the business model of your company? Do you know how your company make money? Do you know what is driving how much profit that your company is making? You can't. You, you ask these kind of questions to to the employee, right? I would say out of ten people, even those who work in the finance role, right? You just ask long enough, you notice that actually, actually they m- might not have idea because their focus, right, is to how to come up with the financial statement, for example, or how to do uh, finance budgeting or how to produce uh, this report for some regulatory or some some uh, report purposes. They, they focus on how to produce things and rather than seeing things from the shareholder perspective, like understand the business model, understand the uh, competitive environment, these kind of things. As an employee, not everyone is involved in that kind of strategic kind of role, you know. So you can't be expecting that someone working in a business or financial role will know how to invest. It's two different things, you know. People who know how to invest doesn't mean they know how to do the detailed work. For example, just now in the early, I do some sharing on like all this, you know, financial statement, right? If you put me into the companies that ask me to prepare the financial statement, right? I would say, I don't know. Like there, there's all sorts of complexity, all sorts of things that you need to know. You need to comply with like uh, US gap. What is US gap? How do they recognize uh, revenue? All these things, all the details things you ask me, I don't know at all. You know, because our, our concerns is not to prepare the financial statements. Our concern is to look at the financial statements and then see whether you think this is a business that you want to own or not. So it's different activities there. Lah. Yeah, okay. But it comes to this, I would say, as long as you read enough, right? You talk to people enough. Um, you, you have some sense on like um, how to pick the business that you would like. Okay. And you don't need to have a degree in finance uh, and, and you don't need to work in, in those roles. Uh. For example, like AK71, right? I recall he's also not someone in the finance uh, or, or business degree kind of role. And, and he also never worked in those roles before. But you, from, from the way he shared, right? You can tell that he, he read a lot. 
So he and he read the financial statements, he read the business. So just 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 that alone is enough to to I mean serve the purpose of helping you to invest your money into individual stocks. Now. But of course, if you say this is not for you, you just want something that is like uh just do uh uh ETF kind of investing, I also think that that's fair, you know. Uh, this is not for everyone uh, picking individual stocks. In in fact, I think that this is this is not this is not for majority of the people. Only like subset of people that really enjoy looking at individual companies and enjoy picking up their own yeah uh, in, uh stocks. Uh. Okay, I think this is enough. Huh? Okay, next one. How does CSPX pay out dividend? Will your holding increase? Okay, CSPX, right? Um, you can. You can imagine that this is a uh, like a company, okay? And this company, they are not doing anything other than just holding on individual companies, like the holdings that the the S and P five hundred holdings, and all these holding that they they hold, right? Of course, these companies they will pay dividends, right? So they will take the dividends, which is in the form of cash that they receive, right? Instead of take that dividends from their holdings and pass it to the the shareholder of this CXPS uh, company, right? They take the cash and then they just use the cash to buy more shares of their individual holdings. Meaning that, for example, they might start out holding, let's say, uh, 1 million shares of Apple. Then as they receive dividends, right, from maybe from other companies as well, and then they will use the cash to buy all these S and P five hundred companies, Apple, Microsoft, all these, they will buy a bit, a bit, a bit here and there. So their holdings of the number of shares that they hold on all these different stocks, right, will increase over time because of this dividend. But there's no dividend that CSPX pay out to the shareholder. Okay, so what it means is that now instead of holding like like uh the the holding is the same, right? Now if you just own CSPX over the long period of time, right, actually you will hold more shares of the underlying, more shares of all these holdings over time. That's what makes the CXPX uh, price grow over time because the net asset value, right, the NAV, right, will increase over time. So if you plot the chart of CXPX versus, the, for example, the SPY, you will see that CXPX, it will slightly, slightly increase over time as compared to SPY because SPY, they pay out. Ma. As you pay out, your NAV increase less than CXPX, right? So your price also also uh will 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 lag behind CSPX. Uh. So this is how it works, uh, okay? If you still need more explanation, let me know. Uh I try my best to to give more concrete um uh explanations. Uh. But for now, I think you, you just remember that this is the NAV that is increasing. Okay. And the N the increase of the NAV come from the come from the dividends that the holding companies or, or, or the individual companies that pay paid CXPX. But cost-effective way to buy CXPX since IBKL commissions around $2 compare buying SPY that less than $1. I would say CSPX, right? You buy using IBKR, that I think that's the best way already. Of course, per transaction basis, uh CSPX is more expensive, okay, because of the London Stock Exchange. But if but in terms of the expense, right, you cannot just look at the trading expense. You need to look at other forms of expense. For example, like withholding tax, right? The thirty percent of the dividend that you pay on the SPY, right? That's also well, some sort of like uh, expenses, right? But it's not. They don't call it expenses. Right? They call it tax because eventually this money will pay to U.S. government. But it's a cost to you, so you need to factor in that as well. And then just now I also mentioned that what happened if there's some accidental death kind of situation happen, right? And my family, when they inherited the the holdings, right? If it is SPY, then I think like like maybe like thirty percent will thirty or forty percent will be gone, you know. So that that one is very painful. So that's why I would say if you consider the estate tax and withholding uh tax, right? These two things, right? Uh, I would say whole CSPX might be better. Uh, depends on on your on your situation, but there's one trick like which which sometimes I recommend to, to people is that if you do monthly DCA, you can just do monthly DCA on SPY. You do it uh, every month uh, from beginning of year till end of the year. As you see your SPY holding become big enough, right? You just sell your SPY and then buy CXPX in one go. 
So like that, you can minimize your trading of the CSPX, right? You don't need to keep on every time buy CSPX in small transactions. You do SPY, accumulate SPY, accumulate enough, sell it all in one go and just buy CSPX in one go. And then repeat again, then continue to accumulate SPY again. So that one also, I think in terms of cost basis, it is, is, is like uh, much more cost effective. The, the important thing is that you don't want to hold SPY until it's like 200K in your portfolio or 500K in your portfolio. You know, as you accumulate it big enough, you just switch over to a CSPX because the holding of the CSPX right, is cheaper. It's just the trading of the CSPX that's more expensive than SPY. Elon makes decisions that exclusively benefit himself. Okay, la, I think this one, uh, definitely there are people who strongly believe on this view. Uh, if you believe so, I think that's fair. I think there's, there's enough uh, evidence to show that he really benefit a lot of things when it comes to the stuff that they have been, uh, he has been doing. La. So he, he take good care of himself. If not, he's not going to be, to be the richest person in the world. La. So I would put it that way. But for ev- for in terms of how he got so rich, right? Say for example, all the stock based compensations that he 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 took, right? For example, I think we have discussed this at length in terms of like how he achieved the milestone, right? I, I think that's kind that's very fair kind of uh conversation to him, given that he's able to set a super high bar and able to to achieve those those. I think this one, even if I'm the shareholder from day one, right? I do think that. Me as a shareholder, I would rather reward him uh, rather than you hire another person that, that didn't benefit himself too much but not able to bring the companies to that level. You know, So for example, like right now, Tesla market cap maybe about 600 plus billion, right? If Elon say, give him, let's say, let, let's like, like give him 500 billion but in return, he's able to bring Tesla to 5 trillion market cap, right? Do you think it makes sense? Uh, do you as a shareholder, are you willing to pay that kind of compensation to him? My answer is very clear. It's yes. Because in, if as long as he's able to generate a lot of value to the shareholders and he want a piece of that, right? To me as a shareholder, I'm willing to give, you know? Yeah. So so it, so it just, it just um, um, like different way to look at things. Lah. Some people say that, wow, he, he enriched himself too much. He's like, there's no moral... Okay, I think that that's one way to look at it. Uh, but there's other other perspective that that you know that can justify say that actually what he's doing, right? What he has done, right, is actually fair. Fair to himself and fair to all the stakeholders. Uh. To add, if Tesla operating metrics becomes normalized, shouldn't their valuations also normalize? Okay, this one I definitely agree. Let's say, right? Let's say we are talking about their revenue growth. I think the most recent one. I forgot about 10% plus, something like that. It's quite low compared to, you know, like 30 or 40% in the past, right? Say, for example, their, their growth is, let's say, 10%. And this growth stuck there at 10% for, let's say, three years, okay? And then their margin also stuck at, like, let's call it like, also 10% margin, okay? FSD also stuck, no improvement. If if this is the expected scenario, right, I will say, why would you pay like 600 plus billion to buy the company? I mean, just roughly speaking, this kind of situation, right? I'll, at most, I'll pay like 200 to 300, maybe 200 billions. Lah. I think that's fair. Lah. If if all, everything's stuck like this, right? I think 200 is, is, is good enough already. I won't pay more. But the reason that it is 600 plus billions and the reason that I haven't been selling all my shares there right, is because I do think that there's still the upside uh, story still there. The upside comes from where? comes from the like in terms of the price cut may stabilize at one point. And then as more and more, all these other companies uh, like got killed by Tesla, they are able to grab a much bigger market shares. That's one. And then in terms of their FSD, uh, that's one. In terms of all the enhancement that they've been doing on gigafactories, the, all the automations, able to churning car at a ch- cheaper and cheaper per unit cost, I think that's one. So there are all these things that I, I'm happy to continue to bet on to say that, okay, one day we will see that the margin will improve, the FSD will churn up more money for them and so on. That's why I've been continuing to hold things. Now. So like, like whether I'm going to all in believe that this all this upside is like something that is a sure thing, I also don't think so. To me, there's like a, there's like a upside scenario there that I still want to participate. But whether I will all in 100%, 
My answer is no. La. So so let's let's be balanced. La. Not not to say extreme all in or extreme say this company is doomed. I'm somewhere in between now, okay? Uh to, to know how much conviction I have, you look at my my portfolio uh, and then look at my how much percentage of my portfolio invested in the companies. La. Okay. So but but I do agree on this statement to say that if everything is normalized, if you believe this is the like like they have this kind of uh so-called weak operating metrics. For longer, right? I do agree that the today's valuation is somewhat too high already. Uh, but but I, I don't think this kind of weak uh weak um metrics will stay on for for that long. Uh. It's a bit like Amazon situations, like Amazon, like I said in the earlier discussions, right? Uh Amazon, there's there's one point that they are like, you know, <laughs> you look at their free cash flow, it's like negative one. It's like tens of billions of negative free cash flow. If I don't believe that they will improve, right? I would have sold already. Uh, I would have sold the, the business already. There's no way that you should invest in a negative uh, free cash flow companies at that kind of valuations for a long period of time, right? But there's, of course, reason to believe that things will improve, okay? That's, that's my take on this. Uh, but but thanks a lot for, for your comment. I, I, I do see your point. Um, it's just that I, I have to explain like why, why uh, in, in terms of why I'm still holding and and um my expectations on, on the company stuff. Okay, the last one. Keep up the excellent work and TCSS Punti. Agree with your stance on content creations. Yep, thank, thanks so much on that. Okay, uh yeah, I know that today's we don't have uh, other people joining. It's a bit like a solo talk from myself for one and a half hours. Thank you so much to all of you who dial in live. Uh, without you all dialing in live, right, it's very hard for me to talk to the screen and then, because I don't know whether people are interested with these kind of things or not, right? So so it's very hard for me to talk, but at least I saw that you all are here. I, I know that you all enjoy the content and supporting uh, me. And thank you so much for your patience. I know always long, long uh, talk here, right, from my side. Okay, I'll end the call here. Uh, if there's any any topics that you guys want me to discuss in more details, feel free to let me know either um, in the Telegram uh, group or just leave a comment down in the YouTube sections for those who, who is watching replay. Thank you so much for, for, for the support. All right, I'll end the call here. Thank you. Bye-bye.